Welcome! This presentation is part one of a series of two talks for the Carnegie Museum of the Keweenaw. It is based on a video presentation that I created for the museum and which was on display there very briefly in March of 2020 before the pandemic lockdown. This is a discussion of some of the sorts of songs that were sung by the women's suffrage movement in the United States during the period between about 1890 and World War I. This was the period during which suffrage groups began to hold more public demonstrations, but before the political climate became altered by World War I. The sound of the suffrage movement is difficult to reconstruct because recordings of suffrage music are extremely rare. There are a handful of commercially recorded instrumental marches, written for suffrage organizations, that have survived on 78 or Edison Cylinder, and a slightly larger handful of comic songs mocking the idea of women getting the vote. We know that in the U.S., women's suffrage campaigns used music to spread their message and to inspire and rally their supporters. Hundreds of pieces of sheet music have survived relating to the topic of whether or not women should be granted the right to vote. Some of these are commercially produced topical songs, both for and against enfranchisements, and others were pieces commissioned by or were written for suffrage campaigns and organizations. We know from photographs and written accounts that suffrage parades sometimes included marching bands and that suffragists sang songs both in private and at public gatherings. Unfortunately, the available sources rarely tell us which songs were actually sung. Sometimes, newspaper descriptions even got the name of the song wrong. Often, written accounts of gatherings are unhelpfully vague, merely noting that a suffrage song was sung, but not giving the name of the song, or that suffrage songs and national hymns were sung, or that suffrage and patriotic songs were sung. The tune playing in the background is one of the few suffrage marches to have survived from the period. The piece is called Fall in Line Suffrage March. Zena S. Hahn composed the purely instrumental piece in 1914 and published arrangements of it both for piano and for small orchestra. It was recorded by the Victor Talking Machines Military Band in 1915. It was composed specifically for the New York State Women's Suffrage Association. It seems that there probably were not a lot of commercial recordings of suffrage music. Although a few other suffrage marches were recorded by other companies, this might have been the only one recorded by Victor. There are three basic types of songs that were used by the women's suffrage movement. First, borrowed songs. These are songs that already existed and which were not altered when used by the suffragists or not significantly altered. The second are the newly composed songs. These are pieces composed specifically for the suffrage movement. Often they were written for or commissioned by a specific suffrage organization. These are the types of songs that will be discussed in this talk. The third are the rally songs, a sort of hybrid category of songs which borrowed tunes from existing compositions but added new words. The technical name for these old tunes with new words is contrafacta songs. These will be the main focus of the next talk in this series. I'm not going to discuss the wealth of commercially printed sheet music. Those have been studied very thoroughly elsewhere. This talk is less about what people might have sung at home in their parlors and more about what they would have sung at meetings, in rallies, and possibly in marches. This talk looks especially at some newly composed songs and their use in rallies and parades. But first, let's look at a few borrowed songs. These are inspirational songs that people would have already known but which were not specifically written for the suffrage movement. These songs were written for a different purpose, but were adopted by the movement because they addressed a relevant topic or carried an inspiring message. We know that during this period, 
social reformers were trying to express their ideas in song. In the foreword to Hull House Songs, which was a collection of several newly composed songs, the social reformer Jane Addams commented on this. She said that it was, quote, imperative that socialized emotions should find musical expression if the manifold movements of our contemporaries are to have the inspiration and solace they so obviously need, end quote. Adams derided what she called old-fashioned songs as chiefly expressing the emotions of love, hope, or melancholy. The only types of songs that she cites as exceptions to these individualistic emotions are songs of religion and patriotism. Religious and patriotic songs are exactly what were borrowed by the women's suffrage movement. We know from the accounts of suffrage societies' meetings that one of their favorite hymns seems to have been America, also known as My Country Tis of Thee, which was considered to be America's national hymn. Less familiar hymns also offered inspiration. Words from the hymn Forward Be Our Watchword, Hearts and Voices Joined, written by Rev. Henry Alford in 1871, appeared on suffrage banners. I'm not sure if you can make out the text on the banners, but both of them read, Forward out of error, leave behind the night, forward through the darkness, forward into light. These lines became especially associated with Inez Mulholland, and the phrase forward into light was adopted as the slogan of the National Women's Party. An example of a patriotic hymn borrowed by the suffrage movement is the Battle Hymn of the Republic. Although the Battle Hymn of the Republic sometimes served as an inspiration for new lyrics, we know that it was also sung as originally written. Even though the Battle Hymn is technically a contrafactum song, meaning that it was a compilation of new words written to an existing tune, John Brown's Body, I consider it to have been borrowed by the suffrage movement because it was written for a different cause, and it is often Julia Ward Howe's original 1862 lyrics that were sung in suffrage meetings. It was written during the Civil War, and the Battle Hymn of the Republic was conceived as a marching and rallying song for Union soldiers. It also had strong associations with the campaign for the abolition of slavery. Here you can see a printed leaflet of songs suitable for women's suffrage, women's Christian temperance union, and other reform meetings. Number one at the top of the sheet is the Battle Hymn of the Republic, and of the 13 songs included, it is the only one not to have been rewritten. Except for the omission of verses 2 and 3, this is the Battle Hymn of the Republic as we usually know it. Despite having inspired many suffrage versions, the Battle Hymn of the Republic had enduring appeal. The Utah Women's Suffrage Songbook from around 1890 and the Pasadena Citizens' Suffrage League Songs, a leaflet from 1911, also both have Julia Ward Howe's text of the Battle Hymn of the Republic as their first songs. At various times, Different groups within the U.S. suffrage movement began to feel the need for their own songs, and they were looking for something new. In October of 1909, newspapers carried a story about a new song called Battle Hymn of the Mothers that answers the well-known Battle Hymn of the Republic written by Julia Ward Howe. Here's a quote from the Chattanooga Daily Times from October 13, 1909. Quote, Mrs. Ida Husted Harper of the National and State Suffrage Headquarters asserts that the new song fills a long-felt musical want in the societies. Quote, it embodies the association's ideas and will make a rousing chorus when sung by hundreds of women to the tune John Brown's Body, said Mrs. Harper. 
We have no real suffrage songs, continued Mrs. Harper yesterday when discussing this musical offering. And while we find the Battle Hymn of the Republic an inspiring chorus, we are delighted to have this new song written expressly for us. End quote. This brings us to the second type of songs sung by the women's suffrage movement. These were the pieces with entirely newly composed words and music which were specifically for the campaign for women's rights and enfranchisement. In addition to fostering solidarity among its members, having a signature song could raise awareness of a particular organization, and printed sheet music could also be sold to raise funds. There were a lot of different women's suffrage organizations, and many of them acquired their own song. Whether it was newly composed or a contrafactum of new lyrics to a well-known tune. There were lots of official songs, many of which were publicized in the newspaper in terms like, here it is, the new national anthem of women's suffrage. Because there is so much relevant printed sheet music, I'm going to use a single historical event as a discussion point. Let's go back to the parade at which Inez Mulholland and Alberta Hill first carried the banner we saw earlier. There's an anecdote which appeared in many newspapers in August of 1911. It relates to specially commissioned songs, but also to whether suffrage songs were sung in their parades or not. Keep in mind that this was a wire service item announcing the winner of the poetry competition, and it was written more than three months after the parade. I will read the story as it appeared in the Record Journal of Meriden, Connecticut. Last May, when the suffragists and suffragettes of New York marched 3,000 strong for five hot, dusty miles down Fifth Avenue, the parade was witnessed from the Waldorf Astoria by a noted Italian composer, a friend and favorite pupil of Mascagni. He was profoundly impressed and approached the leaders with, quote, One grand parade! But you should sing! You should have your own one grand anthem! A Marseillaise of emancipated womanhood! I shall write the anthem, and it shall be impassioned, majestic! You shall sing it from ocean to ocean! Give me the words! And then... The Woman's Suffrage Party of New York advertised far and wide for a poem to be set to music for the National Suffrage Anthem. A prize of $100 was offered. End quote. The Woman's Suffrage Party received 98 entries from around the country. The winning poem was by the author and noted linguist Minetta Theodora Taylor from Greencastle, Indiana. In the background, you will now hear this song played by a synthesized approximation of a brass quartet. The resulting song, called Ballot Song of American Women, seems to have been debuted on October 26th of 1911 during the Women's Suffrage Party Convention at Carnegie Hall in New York. It was performed by the Park Sisters Quartet, who accompanied a vocal quartet. The song was then taught to the audience while the composer of the music, Frederick B. King, conducted. After Mrs. Penfold gave her address, it's reported that the entire audience rose and sang Ballot Song of American Women. When I first ran across this anecdote about the Italian composer who responded to seeing the parade with, But You Should Sing, I thought it was an important piece of evidence that maybe there'd been no singing during early suffrage parades. I thought it would be useful to know whether suffragists sang during their parades or not, so I went back to research the actual parade referred to in the anecdote, the one which was led by the banner beautifully hand-embroidered with the words of the hymn, Forward Be Our Watchword, Hearts and Voices Joined on it. On Saturday the 6th of May, 1911, the Women's Political Union held a parade down Fifth Avenue in Manhattan to protest 
the New York State Assembly's refusal to pass the suffrage bill. It can be really difficult to find reports of which specific songs or tunes were performed at historical events. The use of wire service reports, like those from the Associated Press, can mean that virtually the same account appears in newspapers across the country. Fortunately, some newspapers sent their own correspondents who provide useful details. By comparing newspaper reports, we can construct some of the music from this parade. At the very front of the parade was the banner with the hymn lyrics. Immediately behind that came a Scottish pipe and drum band led by Major John A. Rowe. The band of eight pipers and three drummers began with Woman Suffrage March, which had been written for the occasion by Madame Elsa Gregory. When the bagpipers tired of wrestling with the new tune, the first of the brass bands seems to have taken up the new march. There were an estimated 1,500 to 3,000 marchers and four bands. The Brooklyn Daily Eagle reported, quote, The most popular air was the Marseillaise, and it was heard often in the course of the two-mile tramp. Marching through Georgia was another favorite, together with such old standbys as The Wearing of the Green and Gary Owen. End quote. The Marseillaise and Marching Through Georgia are two tunes associated with the women's suffrage movement. I will mention both of these tunes again, either in this talk or the next one. I'm really grateful for the Brooklyn Daily Eagle. Someone there really seems to have cared about the music in the parades in New York City. It went on to mention a stirring song written to the tune of John Brown's Body, which the women sang with a will and contained the following lines. To whatever heights she reaches, woman's duty goes before. To her influence in statehood, let us open up the door. And as she is duly honored, she will honor love the more. Our cause goes marching on. The description is unclear, however, but it seems that this might not have been sung during the parade, but at the rally in Union Square immediately after the parade. The New York Times reported that Union Square was packed with those waiting to hear what the suffragists had to say. After the Woman's Suffrage March was sung, speeches began from all locations around the square. I could not find Woman's Suffrage March because, although it appears in several newspapers, that's the wrong name. But I could find Madame Gregory. Fortunately, some newspapers correctly identified the name of the march. The clip you'll now hear in the background is the march written specifically for this parade by Madame Gregory. I was tempted to try to synthesize the sound of eight bagpipers and three drummers playing it, but this version is the vocal parts played by synthesized brass quartet. In the Louisville Courier-Journal, the day after the parade, under the subheading, March Written for the Parade, it says, quote, Madame Elsa Gregory, sometime of Turin, wrote especially the Women's Political Union March for the parade. Henry Grafton Chapman fitted words to the swinging notes of Madame Gregory's music words that were later sung in Union Square with Madame Gregory dressed in white and wearing a white and purple hat, waving a white baton over the heads of thousands of singers. End quote. We know that the tune was played repeatedly during the 70-minute long parade. A reporter at the beginning of the parade said that the pipe band had played it as the parade started, and a different reporter mentioned that at the end of the parade, the bands played Madame Gregory's march as the suffragists entered Union Square. Then, before the speeches began, Madame Gregory mounted the music platform and taught the song to the crowd with the accompaniment of the bands. But if this was a brand new song, 
How did she get thousands of people to sing it? The new march was not new to all of the singers. The Women's Political Union had bolstered the thousands of voices by teaching the song to some of them beforehand. On the previous Sunday, they had had a mass meeting at Clinton Hall in Manhattan. The New York Times reported that the Women's Political Union, quote, distributed literature, took pledges to march, and sold copies of the new Women's Political March, which had its first tryouts. Madame Elsa Grigori, the composer, wielded the baton first for the musicians on stage and then for the audience, which sang with a vim. It is to be sung in the procession. End quote. This account and a news item from the previous Thursday suggest that the intention was that the march would be sung by women walking in the parade. But I'm not sure whether it actually happened or not. Since this is a talk about suffrage rally songs, and we have testimony that confirms that this song was sung at a rally by thousands of voices, I should have been content, shouldn't I? But the anecdote about the mysterious, never-named Italian composer still bothered me. Then I realized I might have misread his statements. Perhaps his comments were not addressed to the suffrage leaders in New York in general, but to the leaders of the Women's Suffrage Party of New York in specific. They were the ones who then went on to hold the songwriting contest. They had all just seen a grand parade featuring a newly composed anthem written for the Women's Political Union. Perhaps what he was saying was not, you should sing, you should have your own one grand anthem, but rather, you should sing. You, the Women's Suffrage Party, should have your own one grand anthem. The mysterious anonymous Italian composer, who supposedly inspired the commission of Ballot Song of American Women, would have been gratified to learn that it was sung in at least one grand parade. The Women's Suffrage Party organized a torchlit parade in Manhattan on the evening of the 9th of November, 1912. The parade was, in part, to celebrate women getting some voting rights in Oregon, Arizona, Kansas, and Michigan. Needless to say, planning a nighttime procession with banners, paper lanterns, and flaming torches through a major city was complicated. In a newspaper report, one of the organizers complained about the amount of red tape, mentioning that she even had to get a license for the 200 singers who would be singing Ballot Song of American Women. Although it's hard to tell whether there was any singing in the May 1911 parade, there was lots of singing in the November 1912 parade. The Brooklyn Daily Eagle reported that not only did the parade begin with 200 specially chosen voices singing Ballot Song of American Women, punctuated every few minutes by a dozen female trumpeters playing the stirring strains from the triumphal march from Aida, a contingent of marchers from California swung down the avenue singing the Song of the Western Women. And because the Brooklyn Daily Eagle quotes a few lines from it, we can guess that this might be a contrafacta of the popular song, What's the Matter with Father? Another group, described as Easterners, sang Everybody Votes But Mother. But from the few lines of those lyrics, I can't guess the tune. The Brooklyn Daily Eagle continues, quote, and as the dauntless women strode down the avenue, shoulder to shoulder, shouting and singing for the cause, the bands crashed out. It must be so that the kingdom's coming in the year of Jubilee. And if that were not enough, there was another newly composed song which had been written specifically for this parade, and which was dedicated to the treasurer of the Woman Suffrage Party of the Borough of Manhattan. This song, which had both words and music written by Minnie A. E. Walsh of Brooklyn, was called Our Right is Might. Although the Brooklyn Daily Eagle printed three stanzas of the text, because the tune was newly composed, we don't know what it sounded like. 
From all of this, it seems quite clear that U.S. suffragist groups commission songs to be sung not just at indoor meetings and concerts, but also at outdoor public rallies and in parades. The U.S. suffrage movement also borrowed songs from women's suffrage organizations in the United Kingdom. The most notable example of this was the performance of The March of the Women on the East Steps of the Capitol on May 9, 1914. The March of the Women was composed by Ethel Smith in 1910 to words written by Cicely Hamilton. It was dedicated to the Women's Social and Political Union in the UK and became that organization's anthem. I'd like to point out that part of the reason for these huge and elaborate parades was to get positive publicity. Elaborate and spectacular events get extra space in the newspaper. While suffragists delivering petitions to Congress is news, promising to arrive with a choir of a thousand and then gather on the Capitol steps to sing a song that has only been heard in the U.S. once before, gets media attention. And it's the sort of story that appears in newspapers on the front page, at the top of the page, above the fold. News items about the mass choir began appearing by about April 28th, and focusing on the rehearsal of the Thousand Voices and beginning to give tantalizing details about the anticipated procession. It should not be surprising that a choir, even a small one, would want to rehearse a song which had supposedly only been heard in the U.S. once before. The successful singing of the March of the Women at this event was not just because the choir had rehearsed in advance. Also, a week before the parade, the magazine The Suffragist printed the lyrics to the March of the Women and asked readers to memorize them before the May 9th event. Then, in a special issue produced for the May 9th parade, on the page with the directions for marchers, the suffragist printed the full sheet music for the March of the Women, just in case their readers hadn't memorized it. One of the things you will notice about newly commissioned songs is that employing them required a lot of pre-planning and some rehearsal. This was expected to be one of the largest and most spectacular suffrage parades yet. I will read you part of the description that appeared in newspapers on May 9th, 1914. Keep in mind, this description is not actually a report of what happened. It is a press release. It was sent out through the wire service of the Associated Press and was scheduled to appear on the same day as the parade. It would have been typeset before the parade even began. In the newspaper clippings shown here, although the headlines are different, the description of the event has almost identical wording. The main difference is that some papers ran the full press release while others edited it down. Quite often, it appeared on the front page with a sub-headline highlighting the bands or music. Here's part of the press release from the front page of the Calumet News, Calumet, Michigan, which was published on the same afternoon as the parade. Washington, May 9. With banners flying, ten bands playing, and the women singing a marching song, Several thousand suffragists from various sections of the country today paraded along Pennsylvania Avenue from Lafayette Square to the Capitol. The women presented to the members of Congress petitions asking the passage of the bristow mondell resolution calling for a federal constitutional amendment enfranchising women. Immense crowds viewed the procession along the route. When the Capitol was reached, the bands were massed on the plaza before the East Front, where they played The March of the Women, composed by Dr. Ethel Smith of England, accompanying a chorus of a thousand women. You will now hear part of the recording of The March of the Women, sung by the group Werke's Folk, who are based in Morpeth, Northumberland. 
This is from their CD, Sing Emily, Sing Liberty. Shout, shout, talk with your soul, cry with the wind, for the dawn is breaking. March, march, swing you along, white blows our banner and hope is waking. Song with its story, dreams with their glory, lo they call and glad is their word. Forward, our courage swells, thunder of freedom, the voice of the Lord. Newspaper articles from the next day offer more specific details, but as you can see from the caption, some of them still get the name of the song wrong. We don't know whether suffragists sang the March of the Women as they marched in the parade, but a wire service report filed on Saturday evening suggests that they did. It also mentions that many of the delegations brought their fife and drum corps. From the reports of the parade, we know a few of the other pieces of music heard at the event. From the Chicago Tribune's account, we know that the Marseillaise was played in the parade, and that the Women's Congressional Union apologized, explaining that, as it was the French national anthem, it was being played in honor of the many nationalities present. This statement was probably made to distance the organizer from factions who embraced the Marseillaise as a militant call to arms. According to the Chicago Tribune's report, after the women, with their ten bands, poured onto the broad central flight of steps leading to the rotunda, quote, The entire body of marchers, spectators, and members of Congress joined in singing America and the Star-Spangled Banner. End quote. From context, I assume that this was just before March of the Women was sung. By considering several different reports, we can get a better idea of the soundscape of suffrage parades and outdoor rallies. Often, a single account gives a misleading impression. From the anecdote about the Italian composer, we might have thought that there was no singing in parades. The only images we have of suffrage parades are silent ones, and it's easy to imagine that the suffragists marched in dignified silence. We now know, however, that some of them swung down the street singing counterfacta songs from their own regions. In 1911, although the Women's Political Union seems to have tried to dominate their parade with the march Madame Grigori had composed specifically for them, there was a variety of other music too. Despite the march having been played often in the parade and at the rally in Union Square, where it was taught to thousands of people who then sang it, Despite all of that, the Marseillaise was described as the tune heard most often in the parade, and we know of three other tunes played there as well. At some point during this event, a contrafactum of John Brown's body was also sung. From some of the descriptions of the 1914 performance of The March of the Women on the Capitol Steps, we might have thought that was the only singing done that day. The truth is that a variety of music and songs were heard. One description mentioned that everybody present joined with the Thousand Voice Chorus in singing two patriotic songs, one that was considered to be the national hymn and the other which would go on to become the national anthem. The March of the Women might also have been sung as suffragists marched, and that pesky militant tune, the Marseillaise, pops up in the parade. Even when the Women's Suffrage Party of New York created a grand spectacle by beginning their torch-lit parade with 200 singers performing a song written specifically for them, another piece, also composed for them more recently, was also sung. A brass band played a liberation song from the Civil War, and contrafacta songs were also sung. Simply said, the music at suffrage parades and rallies had variety. There was no single official anthem that unified the sound of the U.S. women's suffrage movement. Organizations within the movement had their own favorite songs and tunes. Suffragists sang not only at conventions and indoor meetings, they also sang at outdoor rallies and while marching in parades, at which there might have been brass bands, 
fife and drum bands, or Scottish bagpipe bands. At such events, you might have heard hymns, or songs borrowed from the Civil War, or songs or instrumental marches newly written for a specific suffrage organization, or counterfacto songs with new suffragist words being sung to old familiar tunes, or most likely, some of all of these. Thank you for listening. Thank you for joining us for this video presentation. Contrafacta songs will be the topic of discussion for the next talk in this series. Part 2 will probably be given as a live talk by Zoom meeting. Please check this website or wherever you get your Carnegie Museum information for further details. We hope you can join us then. Meanwhile, you can listen to another instrumental suffrage march that was recorded on Edison Cylinder by the Edison Blue Amberall label. The march was composed by Alessandro Liberati and played by Liberati's band. The name of the march is Suffragettes March. <laughs>